Questions and comments? The Honorable, the honorable Member for uh, resuming debate, the Honorable Member for Peace River. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's uh, with considerable pleasure that I rise today to speak to Bill C-26, and I know that uh, from my constituency I hear a great concern with regards to the impact of the, gr the drug trade and the drug-fueled crime that results out of the drug trade. With crystal meth, the date-rate drugs, the marijuana grow-ups, and the cl clandestine labs proliferating our communities uh, from coast to coast, Canadians are demanding that this government of Canada take some action. In the last election, we promised to crack down on drug crime. We promised that we would, and this I'm quoting here, introduce mandatory minimum sentences for designated drug trafficking offenses to ensure that serious crime results in serious punishment. And that we would, I'm quoting again, end conditional sentences or house arrest for serious crimes, including major drug offenses. We also promised that we would support results-oriented community-based initiatives for, ad for addiction treatments, training and rehabilitation of those who are in trouble with the law. With Bill C-26 and our national anti-drug strategy, the government is fulfilling these promises. Mr. Speaker, I'm particularly pleased that with the proposed legislation, we will take a strong action to combat marijuana grow-ups. Why do we need these mandatory minimum penalties for grow-ups, you ask? We need them because sentences for these offenders amount to little more than a simple slap on the wrist. Professor Daryl Plakas did a study of all the drug files opened by the police of British Columbia from 1998 to 2003, and his findings underscore the need and the urgency for these criminal law reforms. Professor Plack has found that between two, uh, pardon me, 1997 and 2003, indoor grow operations increased in average size from 149 plants to 236 plants. And it should be noted that hydro bypasses that allow for theft of hydro were seen in approximately one in five grow operations. And also the number of fires associated with grow operations increased from 20, pardon me, from 20, 32 in 1997 to 80 in 2003. And among the sus suspects, these, these numbers are important because I think it draws a, a picture. And among these sus suspects, 57 had at least one other drug conviction, 41% had a prior conviction of some form of violence, 22% had a previous conviction, conviction for production, and 27% had a previous conviction for possession for the purpose of trafficking. On average, suspects had seven convictions occurring over a 13-year period. What kind of sentences are the courts imposing? Members may find it hard to believe, but Professor Plack has found that only 27% of offenders with nine or more non-drug convictions were imprisoned. For offenders with nine or more drug convictions, only 54% were sentenced to jail time. Moreover, cases in which prison sentences was the most serious disposition dropped from 19% in 1997 to 10% in 2003, while condi conditional sentences as the most serious penalty increased from 13% to 46%. When a prison sentence was imposed, the average length was only 4.9 months. Clearly existing sentences were not deterring individuals with multiple convictions from participating in grow-ups over and over again. Mr. Speaker, I believe all members will agree that these sentences were insufficient to deter persons from being involved in marijuana, marijuana grow-ups. Certainly, I do not think they are appropriate. These sentences do not adequately, adequately reflect the serious nature of these crimes. The issue of grow-ups, and specifically crystal meth super labs, is something that I have taken a personal interest in. My private member's bill, Bill C, 428 that is currently being dealt with in the other place deals with rising the penalties for those who produce and traffic in this dangerous drug. And I can tell the members of this House that I've heard from people from coast to coast, 
and they are concerned about the illegal drug use, and they are concerned especially about the deterrents that are in place for those who produce and distribute these dangerous drugs that have such a horrific impact in each one of our communities. It is time that we as Parliament send a needed message as to what we think is appropriate, as to what we think is an appropriate range of penalties within a, what a judge can craft a sentence, taking into account particular circumstances of the offenders. Bill C-26 will set that new range. At present, there is no floor and the ceiling is only seven years. Under Bill C-26, there would be a new maximum of 14 years, indicating clearly to the courts how seriously we as parliamentarians take this type of crime. And more importantly, there will be a mandatory periods of imprisonment that reflect the number of plants and those mandatory minimums will be increased where the production constituted a potential security or health or safety hazard to children who are in the location where the offense was committed or in the immediate area that surrounds it. In the cases where the production constituted a potential public safety hazard in a residential area or where a trap was placed or set and in the case where offenders used real property that belongs to a third party to commit the offense. Under Bill C-26, the penalties will be six months for the production of up to 200 marijuana plants where the production is for the purpose of trafficking and nine months where the offense involves safety and health aggravating factors. It'll be one year for the production of 101, pardon me, 201 to 500 plants and an 18 months where the offense involves, again, a health or safety aggravating factors and two years or more for 500 plants or more and three years where the offense involves health and safety aggravating factors. Clearly, these proposed mandatory minimum terms of imprisonment are measured response and do fulfill the promise to ensure that serious crimes result in serious punishment. And moreover, the proposal fulfills the promise to support addiction treatment, training and re rehabilitation of those in trouble with the law. I remind my members that there were, uh, pardon me, I remind members that where the accused has a previous conviction for serious drug offenses, but where there are no aggravating circumstances with re respect to the offense before the court, the legislation will allow the court to suspend the imposition of sentence if the offender participates in a drug treatment court program. If the person successfully completes the drug treatment program, the court can impose a lesser sentence. Drug treatment courts are fairly new to Canada, but they are, Mr. Speaker, very promising. And I understand that a press conference that was held just, uh, just a little bit ago with regards to Bill C-26, a gentleman by the name of Joe attended. He's the first graduate of Ottawa's drug treatment court, and he spoke eloquently and emotionally about how the court has helped him to be clean for 16 months. Joe has turned his life around and now he can contribute to society, whereas before he used to commit crimes to get the money to feed his drug addiction. I urge all members of this House to support Bill C-26. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Questions and comments? Questions and commentaires? The Honourable Member for Burlington. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the member from Peace River for, their, for his uh, presentation today and uh, highlighting the uh, penalty side of what uh, Bill C-26 is talking about. I also want to congratulate the member for the, his uh, personal work on, uh, on justice issues dealing with uh, drugs and his uh, private member's bill, which is now in the other place uh, for review. The uh, question I have uh, for the member uh, from Peace River is this. Um, uh, he did a, the member did an excellent job of uh, highlighting what uh, the changes to the, this bill will do in terms of increasing penalties for those who are involved in serious drug crime and in terms of uh, its production and sale to to others, could he tell uh, this house what this bill will mean to his community and to his young family in terms of uh, making it uh, a safer place to live in the Peace River uh, district? Thank you. 
The Honourable Member for Peace River. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And as I've had the opportunity uh, to work with my colleagues on both sides of this House, uh, including the member from Burlington, I, I appreciate the support that each one has given me. Uh, in terms of, of this bill and the bills that we've brought forward, um, th there's no question that in my riding of Peace River and the ridings, uh, really from coast to coast, there are people in this country who are asking that we as parliamentarians step in and do the work of protecting our young families and the people in our communities that are the most vulnerable. Uh, there's, there, there's no question. I, I get calls on a regular basis because of my work on the crystal meth front uh, from people from Vancouver, from people from uh, the Maritimes that are concerned about uh, the way that uh, we deal with, that we ensure that we go after first and foremost the people that are producing and uh, distributing this drug specifically to the most vulnerable. In the past, there's been attempts to go after sometimes the most vulnerable and, and, and criminalize uh, their behavior. Absolutely, we want, it, we want to continue to ensure that people are not, uh, are, are not being uh, uh, encouraged to possess drugs. Uh, but we also have to go to the root cause, which is really the, the networking of the manufacturing and the distribution uh, of these drugs. And clearly that is where uh, Canadians have asked us to go. And clearly that's where this government is responding and, and getting tough on, on the real uh, serious crime of producing and distributing uh, the, the, the most uh, serious drugs, and, and this uh, takes us that much further. Thank you. Further questions and comments? 